Hello and welcome to Private Capital. I'm Joe Riley. Today we have John Hurdle, founder and executive chairman of Hurdle Callahan & Co., a $20 billion OCIO firm. I was especially interested to talk to John because he's a real process guy and has been thinking deeply about managers and portfolios for over 30 years. John trained recruits at Paris Island, worked at Goldman, and left with no clients to become a pioneer in what came to be called the OCIO business. We talked today about prediction markets, what he learned from the Mellon family office, and his concept of looking for a uninterrupted chain of logic. John is a regular commentator on national media and is best known for his role in pioneering the outsourced CIO model for families and institutions. Prior to founding Hurdle Callahan, John worked at Goldman Sachs, advising family groups and institutions on investment strategies. Previously, he served as an officer in the United States Marine Corps. He earned his BS and MBA degrees from the Pennsylvania State University. Please enjoy my interview with John Hurdle. This podcast is for educational and entertainment purposes only. Anything said by the guests or host should not be construed as legal or investment advice. Thanks for listening. I'm very curious, what was your first interest in finance and did you ever consider other careers? I did. My undergraduate degree, I thought I wanted to be a veterinarian. It's funny how many, how few people work in their majors, but after college, I went to the Marine Corps and it was a circuitous path, but I had a tremendous experience there. I spent seven years on active duty. My last tour was recruiting officers uh, back at Penn State. And so while I was there, I thought I should get a graduate degree. And one of my fraternity brothers was running the MBA program. So that seemed like the most straightforward approach. And I did that. And while I was in the program, I heard that you could make $100,000 working on Wall Street but you couldn't get a job. And I didn't really know what they did on Wall Street, but that sounded like a lot of money. And I figured I could probably get a job because Marines tend towards confidence. I just had a new, we had our first baby. And so the idea of being the first guy on the beach wasn't quite as appealing as it once had been. I decided to look into this Wall Street thing. And I, I often like to say that I've been relentlessly pursued by good fortune. And my mentor, a guy that turned out to be my mentor, was recruiting at Penn State because Penn State was playing Alabama that weekend. I think it was just a boondoggle excuse for him to go and uh, see the game. But he and I met and he challenged me to learn about Wall Street. And I did. And I ended up working at Goldman Sachs. So uh, I got a lot of job offers, but I was you know, fortunate enough to end up working at Goldman Sachs, which is really where I began to learn the trade uh, of the investment business. And It was just a tremendous time to be there when it was a small, uh, really meritocracy. It was a partnership still, very personal, diverse people, just a terrific experience. Both the Marine Corps and Goldman were examples of me being pursued by good fortune. And I had got, I think I got launched well and was excited to learn the craft from at one of the great firms of all time. So now was that Arthur Miltenberger? Arthur was the CIO at the Mellon. So my my mentor there was Bill Groover, who ended up being a professor at at Bucknell and uh, still a great friend. And Arthur's a great friend too. But Arthur, uh, my experience with him was later on. And he was the first CIO I really ever met. And he was the CIO at the the RK Mellon branch of the Mellon family. Okay, we'll get to that. So I watched Heartbreak Ridge and Full Metal Jacket recently. What does Hollywood get right? And uh, what does Hollywood get wrong about training recruits? Well, that's a pregnant question. There's, they don't get much right, to tell you the truth. So there were a couple of scenes at Paris where they have Paris Island and they have that guy, F. Lee Army, whatever, acting like a drill instructor. That's pretty accurate. But a lot of it after that isn't. The Marine Corps, it's like a fraternity and it's a tremendous organization and, and it's high standards. One of the things that they, the practical things is that they're interested in potential, but they want it to become kinetic very quickly. That high school counselor said, oh, you have so much potential. You're so great. They don't have a lot of patience with that. It's you got to bring it. And I just had a tremendous experience in the Marine Corps. I was, I was right after Vietnam. I just missed the war. And at the time that kind of aggravated me, but now I'm thankful for it. And so I was on active duty for seven years and just served with tremendously idealistic, selfless, mission-driven people. So I had a tremendous experience and there's some nuances they get right, but a lot of it they don't. You mentioned recruiting officers. What are you looking for in officer talent? It starts with this notion of idealism and selflessness and wanting to serve your country. And then they've got to be, at Penn State, we recruited, there were a lot of engineers. So we were looking for pilots. 
It has to be somebody who's physically capable. It, it's physically very difficult to be a Marine. We talk about pilots. Marine Corps is really all about the infantry. So that guy that's going into the field and leading for a long period of time. And from the minute you go in, your health starts to deteriorate. So you've got to be in great physical shape and the capacity for endurance and so forth. So idealism, intellectual capacity, toughness, desire, that aspiration to be a Marine. And so those are some of the things you look for. You said your health deteriorates? As soon as you go into the field or certainly in combat, your health starts to deteriorate because of the stress and lack of sleep and limited food and so forth. So you really, that's why you have to be at such peak condition going in because you want to be able to be, you want to be, start from a point where that gives you more endurance so that you make good decisions and you can be effective and so forth. So you really, when you think about why are Marines in such good condition, that's really it is when you go in, you've got to start from a high point because it begins to deteriorate. You think that implies to investment managers? I do think investment managers have to take care of themselves because you've got to be at your best. And so this notion of endurance is key. Yeah, I don't think it deteriorates as fast. And I don't, it's not the same. You should be sleeping at night. Whereas if you're sleeping among 8,000 mosquitoes in the middle of nowhere, you, you tend to sleep poorly. So anyway, I, I think there's maybe the mental toughness and the discipline one of the things I, I like to think about is we learned this in the Marine Corps and also in, I did a little bit of mountain climbing. And one of the phrases that I like is disassociation and method. So when you get into a jam, you want to fall back on your discipline, on your method, what you've been trained. So for example, in the Marine Corps, when you take a hill, the first thing you do is dig in because you know that you're most susceptible to a counterattack as soon as you've taken that position. You don't think about it. You don't discuss it. You don't get to the top of the hill and say, gee, what should we do now? You dig in immediately. And on mountain climbing, for example, if you're at the top of a peak and there's a thunderstorm, you know that you take off everything metal, you coil ropes, and you try to make a low profile. That's what you do. And so you don't have time when you're in a crisis to reinvent your discipline, your method. And that's true, for example, in the financial crisis when we got to a place where valuations were so low and people were very nervous and looking at whether the financial markets were going to hold, you had to look at certain factors based on this years of discipline and years of analysis and say, this is telling us to start buying. You got to start buying. It doesn't feel comfortable, but you've got to do it. So you got to stick with your discipline. And I like that phrase, disassociation and method. I would never compare investment management to combat, but there is a stress level. Years ago, I worked on the floor of the NYMEX and the Marines used to come down to observe the floor trading and see what they could learn from how traders handled stress. And I know folks at Millennium have told me that there's definitely periods of burnout and they have issues of folks who have probably been in the field too long, so to speak. I think you need to watch each other. That's one of the things about teamwork, check on each other. Is that decision process, is that consistent with what we have done in the past? So I think that teamwork matters. It's on a slightly different level. One of the things that's interesting to me is the information that's in markets. So after 9-11, the CIA talked about creating a market, an insurance market against terrorism. And there was a public outcry that the government or somebody was going to make money on the human tragedy of terrorism. But really what it was about was trying to find the information. If we have, and markets have information in them. That's one of the things we like to think about it. And certainly in, in investing is you want to, when in doubt, you got to listen to the market. The market's telling you things. And it's also true with some of these international factors. And for example, terrorism. Have you studied any of these prediction markets since then? I've studied a lot about predicting. And one of my, one of the books I think is a go-to book is super forecasting. There's some classic books that you just come back to. And one of the stories in there, uh, which is a great illustration, I think, is Tetlock, who's the author, uses the example of betting on the weight of a prize ox at the county fair. And the guy that raised the ox, is, and he's the expert. So we think about the analogy of using experts to predict outcomes. And, and the book really undermines that whole notion. And yet we do it again every day and a day and a day out. You listen to economists on the news and market experts predicting. 
So anyway, the, the uh, guy that raised the ox is not uh, an accurate predictor, and the butcher is not an accurate predictor. No one is an accurate predictor more than the collective of all the people, the average of all the people betting on the weight of the ox. So if you take all the bets and you average them, which is the market, that's the better best predictor. And so you really have to say to yourself, using sports analogy again, if you were going to work, if we were going to bet on the who was the outcome of the Eagles Giants game, first thing you'd say is what's the Las Vegas spread. So that's the market casting their votes. And you have to have some information that is different than that, that you think you know more than the market to vary from that market. And that's in a lot of ways what you're looking for with active managers. Who has an edge? What is it that is going to let that person be more accurate than the market? So you went to Goldman after the Marines. Give us an inside view of what the 87 crash was like for our younger listeners. <laughs> that's a long story. You can there's like first derivative, second derivative. The first derivative is the market went down 22%. And so that would be like the Dow dropping 8,000 points today. But it was worse than that because the market never saw that kind of even close to volatility. I think if the market went down 8,000 points today, there would be a lot of hue and cry. But people would look at it and say, oh, it'll come back. We've seen cataclysmic events in the markets. The markets are unusually volatile. There's tremendous volume. Prior to 87, 82 was really the beginning of the bull market. So you'd had five years of great markets but derivatives were just coming into play. The volume was quite low. I remember the first 100 million share day in August of 82. And so people weren't ready for this kind of volatility. The markets were not ready. It actually shook the markets. It's interesting because it came back quickly. There was nothing fundamental wrong with valuations and so forth. The economy was strong. It was really more a technical problem where we had something called portfolio insurance, which was dynamic hedging. And it was the beginning of really people using options routinely. And the notion of dynamic hedging and portfolio insurance is intuitively logical. And that is if you have a portfolio of 50% stocks and 50% bonds, and the stock market goes up, you are in a sense playing with house money. So you can take more risk. You're f and so that's the idea was you bought more stocks as the market rose, and you sold stocks as they dropped. And so mathematically, this made sense. And that was one of the lessons was, it might make sense in theory, but everybody can't do it at the same time. And when this started to be implemented, there was a cascading effect. And so the market just started going, we didn't have circuit breakers in the market and so forth. It really was a, it was a crisis. Nobody, and you got to remember also that big firms like Goldman Sachs, it was all a partnership. There was partners capital only standing behind these firms. And so that's the first derivative experience was jaw dropping, that the market could go down that fast and far. Then there are a lot of implications. Like I think you could make the case that this is, that was ultimately one of the reasons that Glass-Steagall was repealed and also that Goldman Sachs became public because that partner's capital model wasn't really enough to back up a global investment bank that was in operating in all these markets. What did you learn from the Richard Mellon family office? That's an essay. That's a <laughs> so uh, Arthur Miltenberger uh, was the first CIO I ever met, and he's still a great friend and, and role model. And a Penn uh, State guy. Yep. We're everywhere. I think it's the largest alumni association in the world or something. But anyway, he is a proud Penn Stater as I am. And Arthur was a different thinker. He lived in and operated in bucolic Ligonier, Pennsylvania, which is in the Laurel Highlands, uh, an hour plus east of Pittsburgh, and uh, was consistently outperforming Goldman Sachs. And that was a shocker to me because we were working hard. And my mentor, Bill Groover, going back to that story, the day I joined, he had been a submarine officer and said, I looked at him and said, what's the noble cause? And he knew I wasn't kidding. And he said, the client is a noble cause. And I said, okay, I'm out. In retrospect, I think what a great answer that was. And that a lot of places at Wall Street, people would have said, what do you mean noble cause? This is Wall Street. But he didn't. He right away said the client. So we went out and worked really hard. But we were pretty consistently disappointing and disappointed with outcomes. And when I met Arthur, I realized he had a different model, which was this notion of a powerful, they had about three and a half billion in those days, which is still a lot of money, but it was even more then. And he was, he had this independent office model. So he was cherry picking the world for best in class talent. 
Uh, he wasn't using Goldman's, Goldman's approach or Merrill's approach or J.P. Morgan's approach. He was cherry picking everywhere. So it was the idea of having 10 specialist athletes versus one decathlete. So no matter how you are, if you're at one firm and you're a decathlete, no matter how good you are, you can't beat 10 specialist athletes. So that was the notion of open architecture, that pure open architecture, which is what Yale uses and, and Arthur used, is a better approach to security selection. And then the other thing is that Arthur had a very disciplined process for capital allocation. If you look at, that's a sort of two sources of value added, where most people only have one, security selection. And in our model at Goldman, we had security selection only, and we weren't as good as his 10 specialist athletes. And he had this disciplined process of dynamic capital allocation. The structure itself was superior. And that's one of the things that was you know, really one of the key reasons we started Hurdle Callahan is if the client was a noble cause, and if we were working as hard as we could, but we were disappointed with outcomes, and we found a different structure that was fundamentally better. And the next part is we really couldn't do it at Goldman Sachs. And in those days, I feel like the firm was wise in saying that this isn't appropriate for our business. For one thing is they a lot of the money managers that you would hire and fire were clients of Goldman. And so that made it difficult. And then the second thing is the nature of real investing. One of the things you have to do is be cost conscious all the time. And so that means lower fees for Goldman Sachs if we were to do it at Goldman Sachs. And I like to think of it as the Mayo Clinic, which is, I, I think of a Hurdle Callahan as like Mayo Clinic versus Merck, pharmaceutical sales versus medicine. Medicine is a much less lucrative business than pharmaceutical sales. So they're both in healthcare, but the concept was that Arthur Miltenberger had transcended this product sales model, which is what most people are using, and was really exploiting it on behalf of the Mellon family. So that was really the point uh, where we had philosophically backed ourselves in a corner, better way to manage serious money, can't do it at Goldman Sachs, have to leave to start our own enterprise. So Blackstone started around that time. And I'm very interested in the historical perspective. What was the hedge fund and private equity landscape like in the late 80s? You're trying to make me feel bad, right? Blackstone and BlackRock both found about that time. And here we are at 20 billion and they're at 20 trillion or whatever. <laughs> anyway, hedge funds, first of all, when I started in the business in 82, the world was much simpler. It was stocks, bonds, and cash US. International was still as an, an exotic. The derivatives were an exotic. Hedge funds were an exotic. Private equity was almost non-existent. One of the things that Arthur Miltenberger did that was so successful is he was one of the first investors with Carlisle and with Oak Tree. So he was very early on with those and he saw the, the value of those firms. So another indication is how you can make a lot of money in private markets if, you, if, you know, if you're with the right managers. So that was another thing I learned from Arthur. But anyway, going back to the questions on hedge funds, it was a much less efficient market. So there was an opportunity to add value in models that were like hedge funds. So this was really prior to the sort of explosion in the hedge fund space. It had just been getting started. And fast forward, it's very hard to get an in to information edge today, not just because of computing power, which has become massively cheap, but also things like Reg FD after Enron, where it is actually illegal to do some of the research that used to be considered astute research in that long gone era. The Peter Lynch era. I think about that Peter Lynch era where people routinely beat the markets, the good managers, is gone. Most active managers today, if you analyze them properly, traditional managers uh, are not adding any value net of fees. There's no alpha net of fees if you analyze them properly. And this is because of these secular trends in the industry. Hedge funds were still that were just getting, really just getting ramped up in those days. Why do you think they blew up in the early 90s? It blew up in size. Yeah. All these things that blow up in size are a popular phenom. And Howard Marks likes to say what the wise man does first, the fool does last. So part of it is just this, that's where the money wanted to go. But part of it is inefficiencies. And part of it is information flow, asymmetric information flow. So before Reg FD, People were getting first calls. There was asymmetric information flow. 
And so some of the great managers were just great managers. I don't want to diminish that. There are some managers that are just gifted, great managers. But a lot of them weren't. One of the things that always amazes me is people will say to me, oh, I just gave manage money to this manager, this hedge fund guy. He's so smart. They Everybody's so smart. I, there's not Being so smart is not an edge in itself. There, there are just too many very smart, very hardworking people working in the industry for that to be an edge. So they are very smart, but the best were also very connected in those days. And so they were getting asymmetric information flow. And a lot of that's gone away. And so the numbers were there. And what, would, for example, we look at Yale and some of the early adopters in Ivy's, they were using these hedge funds in lieu of bonds to stabilize the, the portfolios while they got and to you know get returns higher than bonds while being stable. That was the concept because bonds didn't give you a high enough real return to meet your spending policy. So some of this came out of institutional space and it became popularized there. Then the other thing is there was just a huge proliferation of marketing because that two and 20 mar- model, quoting Howard Marks again, he said, it's not an asset class, it's a compensation scheme, right? Of course, two and 20 is an amazing model if you're the, if you're the hedge fund. And so if you're a great salesman and you're bright and you can convince people to join you and you get paid two and 20, so part of it was just push, sales push, that everybody, there was a popular interest in hedge funds and then tremendously bright, active people selling them. And, and that worked for a while until it didn't. I'm sure like most Goldman alum, you continue to follow the firm. What do you think about the recent evolution of Goldman? I've been gone a long time. I've been, we've had our firm for 35 years and uh, we just had, let me tell you about some of the great things about Goldman, we just had our 40th reunion of our training class and almost everybody came back from all over the world. There were only two, two of our classmates are still working at Goldman. And so it really speaks volumes about what an amazing place it was to work in those years. And so I feel very grateful to have learned, worked there and to have been trained there and to have the relationships that I cherish from there. It is a much, much larger organization when I joined, I think it had 2,000 people. So it's very hard to compare the two. There are cultural dimensions of Goldman that are still obvious that are outstanding. The quality of the talent, the quality of the work ethic. During the great financial crisis, I think their risk management was better than other people. And I think that's the heritage of the partnership. When, you know, when you're a general partner and you have joint and several liability for everything that the firm does or fails to do, then you really focus on risk management. And I think that heritage persists. But I don't follow it that much. And I just admire Goldman. I continue to admire him, but I think it's a very different firm than it was when I was there. What do you think the drivers of success are for the Yale model? And what aspects of it do you think people try to execute foolishly, as in trying to do things they can't replicate? David Swenson, before he passed away, said, don't do what I do, think what I think as I think. So first of all, there was a prominent consultant probably 25 years ago going around the country telling everybody to invest like Yale. And we took exception to that because Yale has an unusual fact pattern. I'm sure this isn't precisely accurate, but they, I believe they have a AAA rated balance sheet and they are, say, quadruple subscribed by qualified full pay applicants. So that means their operating and financial risks are both quite low. And so when you're looking at allocating assets and liquidity, you have to think about your own fact pattern. And most people can't live with the illiquidity that Yale has built into their program. Yale has access to great managers. When you're looking at private equity space in particular in venture capital, private credit, uh, it's not just a what you know game, it's also a who you know game. So it is a, when you get into venture capital and private credit and private equity, a lot of the asset class decisions are overwhelmed by the manager decisions. And so this goes back to the notion of it's not just a what you know, it's a who you know game. And they have terrific access. They were early adopters. They have a great alumni network. And so they can get to managers that other people can't get to. We, in recent, five years ago, hired people out of the Ivies specifically to enhance our network. 
So a lot of that's one of the things that people don't understand. The difference between a great manager in public markets and a bad manager in public markets may be 2%, 200 basis points of performance. In private markets, it could be 25%. So you've really got to be with those top quartile managers if you expect to get the impact that a Yale experiences. You started the firm with no clients. How did you map out year one? <laughs> yeah. First of all, I was 35. I was and still pretty confident. Secondly, I felt like I could always go back to being a broker, which is basically what we were at Goldman Sachs. I knew the trade well. And so we had a line of credit that we, and I had a great friend co-signed for the line of credit. So we didn't have to put our houses on uh, at risk. And about halfway through the first year, the bank said, okay, you haven't brought in any clients yet. You, you know, the line of credit's over. So we went from making pretty quite a bit of money at Goldman Sachs to making none. And I have this great story where I went to the grocery store and we had young children and I came home and I said to my wife, I said, something's wrong at the grocery store. They said that I had $17 in our banking account. And I thought she was going to say, because she paid the bills, that that's ridiculous. I made a mistake. She goes, I know. It's a sort of, that, that was the low point. It's one of those entrepreneurial stories that most of my entrepreneurial clients have that it's Eddie Cantor said that the average overnight success takes 20 years. It's harder than you think. And it doesn't start out. What, what happened in those years was I would tell the story to everyone, how we were creating this independent office and that we were going to cherry pick the world for best in class talents and have no conflicts of interest and be focused on the client. And everybody loved the idea. And then they'd say, and how much money do you have in our management? And we'd say, no, none. And they'd say, well, come back and see me when you have some. So it was, we were encouraged by the fact that everybody liked the idea. Nobody said that's a bad idea. Everybody said it's a great idea, but they wouldn't give us money until we had a, already had a business. So eventually we got, a, it, it grew slowly. Uh, you know, our first account was a $5 million account. And very slowly it started to pick up. And then the first billion is the hardest, a lot of people say. And, and, and that's the way it worked. How did you change your staffing as you grew? How do you know how to strike a balance? That's another one of those questions you could talk about for a long time. You work with what you have until you can upgrade. And I think most people have this same concept. Don Callahan was the internal person and I was the external person. My wife did legal, finance, audit, compliance, everything like that. We had one assistant one point, I remember she asked, we were in a queue. We, had, we got started, we had a joint venture with SEI. And uh, Al West, who's the uh, founder of SEI, was very kind to us and helped us get started. So we had shared space in SEI's headquarters. We, they never owned any of us. We just had this joint venture and it worked out for both firms. When SEI, when we started with SEI, SEI was not an investment firm. So it was really a computer firm. That joint venture was productive for both of us. But anyway, we had this internal cube. We used to, uh, I used to call upstairs to see what the weather was like because we had no windows. And, and our secretary at one point asked if she could read because she had nothing to do. There was no phone calls. There was nothing going on. And I said, sure. So, and then over time, for example, we hired our auditor, came in to be our chief operating. Eventually became our chief operating officer. And so you do what you need to do that's practical and keep the clients as your foremost concern and do whatever you have to do to keep that client, to serve that client well and accurately. And then I think at some point you have to say to yourself, and this is often true with entrepreneurship, is the team that got us to through phase one, are they capable to get us to phase two? And oftentimes, and there's been a lot written about this, that's not true. The group that gets you started isn't the group to get you to the next level. And that's when the staffing really starts to become more sophisticated. We often talk about the large number of wealth management firms that never seem to get past, say, two to five billion. Do you have any insight into the choke points of building an investment firm? That is an interesting number, Joe, because when you get to, I remember when we got to about five billion, there is a moment in time where you say, this is hard. And getting to the next level is going to be, we have to double down. Now, we had a great experience at that moment in time where we got one of our first large college endowments. And they said to us, and they had $460 million, and they said, we really need help on private equity. And if we hire you, will you develop 
that private equity capability that we need. Uh, and not just searching for managers, but also administering the program, understanding how much money you have committed and how much is coming in and the whole administration of that. And we said we would. And so they hired us and we took really all the revenue from that first large institutional client and, and invested it into the private equity program. But in a sense, it pushed us through that barrier. We just, all of a sudden now we're on the other side of 5 billion. We've got more capability. And by the way, that client is still with us over 20 years later. And today is at a billion five. It's been a very successful relationship. But I think a lot of people have a hard time doubling down at that moment. They know the firm's worth something and they want to either take money off the table as in a sense, live better because they work so hard or they want to sell. Uh, and to the idea that you have to actually reinvest in the business to break out is hard for most people to accept and grasp, I think. So I know you have a, a very definite idea of what an OCIO is and what it isn't. How can I tell the difference? Well, the first key is that your compensation cannot vary with your asset allocation. That is sacrosanct. And that is the fundamental and most significant conflict of interest. So you can't be a trusted advisor David Swenson, Arthur Miltenberger person, if you are selling products to your clients and if your organization is selling products to your clients. If I recommend to you to increase your exposure to emerging markets and I or my firm gets more revenue because of that, that undermines the entire relationship in our view. So this is not product sales. It's like going to your doctor. If the doctor says, this doesn't seem to be working, take this other medicine and he makes more money because he recommended this medicine. That's just wrong. So the product sales model, which is what traditional firms are all built around culturally, is fundamentally flawed when it comes to having a CIO relationship as a professional advisor, professional service relationship. So we need to start with that structure. Beyond that, you've got to have the sophistication and reach and a little bit of growth. You've got to have some steady growth because that's how you hold talent. So very small firms could be terrific people and well-intended. But unless they have, in my view, kind of $5 billion, they're not really able to have the access and the power and the capability that they need to do a first-rate job for the clients. But most of the people who say they're OCIO are, in my view, disqualified because of that first issue. So the big firms, Goldman Sachs, BlackRock, and so forth, the, the banks, so people like that who have hidden fees, they've got, they're culturally... There's just like a lot of these systems, you'd have to have forensic accounting to know what your cost really is. That doesn't happen with a CIO model. CIO model is very straightforward. You get paid, a, there's an asset management fee and that's it. And it doesn't vary with what your allocation is. So it's very much like having a salaried office. You know what the cost of your office is, just like David Swenson, just like Arthur Miltenberger. So we really replicated that model. And I, I think that's the key. If you can replicate the independent office model, that's the first requirement for being an OCIO. So structure is the most important. That's where it starts. Then you can differentiate among OCIOs by philosophy and execution. But the structure, the OCIO structure should replicate something like they experience at Yale. Do you folks start with risk first? We start with planning first. Our notion is to deliver, our mission is to deliver success with the highest possible degree of certainty. So what is success? So every client and every account for every client, and with a family, we have lots of accounts. Each family has a foundation and it has mom's account, and dad's account, the kids' trusts, and so forth. So there are lots of accounts for each family. And each one of those accounts has a different definition of success. So it's like a health program. My fitness program is different than a 23-year-old triathlete's fitness program, but they can both be successful. So we have to first define success. And then when you talk about risk, Joe, one of the things I, we like to insist at our firm is that you always precede the term risk with a qualifier, volatility risk, the risk of mission failure. And so the biggest risk is the risk of mission failure. If you really go through that waterfall and you say, how do I get where I want to go? What's my, in a family situation, what's my current spend? What is my philanthropic need? And what legacy do I want to create? So what, how do I put those three things together in terms of a, a mission? And then how do I achieve that mission with the highest degree of certainty? 
When you're talking to board, where does the rubber meet the road in your policy portfolio discussions? How much is education on your end or is it more of a give and take? Well, a CIO is different than a consultant. This is another, you mentioned what's the OCIO. An OC, a CIO is a money manager. He's a trigger puller. He'd say he's the master or she, the master money manager of the multi-manager, multi-asset program. How do you pull it all together? Point accountable. So the idea of one of the things uh, about a CIO is point accountable. It's not, the committee is not point accountable. The CIO is point accountable. When you hire a CIO, you got to believe in that manager's and that CIO's style. So it's just like hiring a money manager. What's the manager's style? Do they have what we call an uninterrupted chain of compelling logic on how they manage money? And do you like that style? And if you do like that style, then you've got to let the CIO work. You can't micromanage the CIO and stop the CIO from implementing the style that you hired him or her to implement. So it's more education. It's aligning the client. Here's what we're trying to achieve, talking to the board. Yes, yes, everybody agrees. Here's how we're going to achieve it. And here's why that process makes sense. Here's why the process is likely to work. Won't work every day, won't work every quarter, but it's going to work. What inefficiencies are we capturing? What is our edge in the market? And so those things comprise a style and it's more education than give and take if it's done right. Of course, it's give and take because we work for the committee or we work for the family. They're the boss. We're the CIO, but we're not the CEO. So we work for that. But in a perfect relationship, the family or the committee allows the CIO to apply his craft. I really like this idea of the uninterrupted chain of logic because you have the noise of the market on one side, you've got the demands of the client on the other. I'm, I'm interested in, in how you came up with that concept. From interviewing hundreds of managers over the years, just every time you're looking for that gap in the logic. And when you say we do A, we do B, we do C, trust me, we do D, we do E. No, go back. let's go back to that trust me part. Explain to me what you mean by that. And the reason that's true is that every manager has a style and you've got to know what it is. And if the manager doesn't have a style and a commitment and conviction, then they're unlikely to be great. So all the great managers, when you hear them talk, their style rings through. And the old mnemonic that we used to use, which is still very relevant, is the four Ps, people, process, portfolio, performance. So when you hear that First of all, you get to have people you really believe are trustworthy, high quality people. There are too many good managers in the world to ever compromise on the quality of the people you're entrusting with your money. And A and B, they're going to make thousands of decisions where you're not in the room on your behalf. So you really got to believe they're high quality people. That's number one. Number two, tell me about how you manage money. What's your process? And that's got to ring with compelling logic. Then you look at the portfolio and say, does it reflect that process? Are you disciplined in your application? And then finally, after most people start with performance and work backwards, we are the opposite. We're looking at the last thing is performance and say, does that performance, is it consistent with the process that you just articulated? So if you're a value guy and value stocks are down, you're going to be down. That's the way it is. So that's how that uninterrupted chain of compelling logic came up. And I think it's a, for ourselves, we are constantly saying, is our logic uninterrupted? Is it compelling? What are we missing? And so that's this internal mechanism for high standards. Do you have a particular process for doing that? We actually look at our performance at the end and we're saying, when we made the decision that led to that performance, how do we feel about that decision in retrospect? Was it a great decision? Now, let me, this gets into sort of statistics. Jack Meyer, who used to be the CIO at Harvard, said, the best money managers in the world are right 53% of the time. So you have to understand statistics that goes back to um, super forecasting and how you make decisions and how you weight your decisions and so forth. But if you could be right 60% of the time as an allocator, you're in the Hall of Fame. So that means by definition, you're going to be wrong 40% of the time. It's just the way it is. In other words, if God said to you, this is an 80-20, I'll tell you right now, statistically, this is an 80-20, you're always going to take the 80 but the 20% of the time, you're going to be wrong. So in retrospect, if an asset went your way, if a decision went your way, was it a great decision that went your way? Or was it a great decision 
on the other side, was it a great decision? You made the right decision, but it was the 20. It didn't go your way. Would you make the decision any differently in retrospect? Or knowing what you knew at the time, you say, no, that was the right decision. Or in retrospect, you say, knowing what I knew at the time was not a great decision. So that's the kind of retrospective that helps you continue to refine your process. Do you actually have a formal process for that? Is that like part of the Monday meeting? It doesn't happen every week because we need more time than that, but it's quarterly. And we have the investment strategy committee goes through that process. How do you know when to support a lagging manager and when to let go? This is uh, ties in, Joe, to how well you hired that manager. So do you really understand the process? And is the manager doing what they said they were going to do? So if you believe that the manager is applying the process that you hired, that you wanted when you hired them, and if you believe that process is still logical, then you should stick with them. One of the things that you mentioned before that I have strong opinions on what an OCIO is, I also have strong opinions or I'm very interested in the impacts of ERISA on the investment world in general. So ERISA was the Employee Retirement in- Income Security Act of 1974. And it made corporate officers liable for the prudent management of the corporate pension fund. So it changed pension fund investing immediately. That's what led to the development of the 401k. It led to the development of the pension consulting industry. And it developed perspectives that nobody had seen before. And one of the ones is something called tracking error. So tracking error is how much does the manager vary from the underlying index that they're trying to beat? Well, that's interesting. And, and it's really more of a CYA metric than it is a return on investment, ROI metric. And it's really designed, a lot of the ERISA, post-ERISA pension investing is designed to protect the officers if they get sued by the Department of Labor. So I get that in pension fund investing, but it also has seeped into endowment investing and family investing. And so the notion that you can, that a manager can outperform dramatically without varying dramatically is nonsensical. In other words, if you want differentiated outcomes, you've got to have differentiated behavior in everything you do. So most asset gathering managers, the managers that are in the world of pensions that most people have heard of, big names that are interested in getting big assignments, are screened by pension consultants who say they don't want more than 200 basis points, 2% of tracking error variability from the index. Our rule of thumb is a good manager can get maybe a 20% return on his tracking error. In other words, if he varies by 2%, he might outperform by 40 basis points, 0.4%, 20% of 200. Sorry to be arithmetic here uh, over the long run. The problem with that is that the manager's fee is 35 basis points. So this is one of the reasons that managers don't add value is they don't have enough tracking error. They don't differ enough to actually be differentiated from the underlying index when it comes to performance, especially net of fees. So this was a long going back to, we want managers that have tracking error. We want managers that are varying dramatically from the benchmark. So there are going to be times when they're way behind by definition, 5%, 6% behind. That's how you get the outperformance over the long run. That with skill. They got to have the skill. But if you believe they have the skill, you got to give them the room. Warren Buffett does not care about tracking error. How has your tech stack changed over the years? Do you find the granularity of the data available now has changed your management? I think it's just taught us how hard it is for people to get an edge. Let's take a step back. Way back when, we used to use consultants to get manager data. We don't need that anymore. That's all available online. That industry has gone away. There's really no reason to have consultants today. The data is available. So that's a very straightforward one. But beyond that, the computing power has gotten so low cost and available that it is very hard for people to get an edge. And so we've become much more skeptical. And the key is always skeptical, never cynical. We want to be skeptical about manager performance. And our ability to analyze it shows that 90% of the long-only managers, if they're analyzed properly, aren't really adding value. In other words, they may not be a clone for the S&P 500, but they're a clone for a sub-index that we can create based on their style. And we can create it for three basis points. 
So the idea of having that active manager has become more clear over the years that it's hard for managers to outperform if, if you really understand what they're doing and you do the statistical analysis around it. Very hard for managers to find statistical anomalies because as soon as it's available, everybody knows about it based on the computing power. Those are some of the examples, but our computer stack evolves every year and uh, our technology stack and not just for uh, analysis, but also for processing and aggregating data and so forth. So it's all of us are big beneficiaries of technology. And that's area one of the areas where we invest a lot in because as Mark Andreessen said years ago, software is eating the world. What do you think the opportunity landscape looks like now for private equity? So let me take a step back. We believe that there are structural advantages in private equity. So no matter what the market is doing, there are structural advantages in part of private equity. There are thousands and thousands of private companies in the United States to be invested in and around the world, as opposed to a fraction of that in public space. The illiquidity is an advantage. The leverage, if it's done right, is an advantage. So there are structural advantages that lead with good managers, and that's key, to outperformance almost in any market if you match up the time periods appropriately. So if the market, if the U.S. equity market is up 10 and your private equity portfolio is up 15, that's great. You got a 50% premium. If the U.S. equity market is up five and you got a 10% return in your private market, that's even better. You got a 100% premium. You get twice the return you did in your public markets. So we do think it is related to public markets because a lot of the exit strategies go into are sold to public companies and that the valuations are looked at relative to public companies. So it is definitely related, but we think the structural advantages are always there if you're with good operators. And that's key. So manager selection in private markets and access to great managers is absolutely critical. And what do you think about the space currently? We like it. Now, we, we like private equity. We like venture capital. We like private credit. So all three of those areas, once again, just because there's structural advantages and having found great operators, we consistently add return above the public alternatives. What does your model allocation look like today? Today, we are continuing. We still believe that equities are more attractive than bonds. So we're fully exposed to equities. We're overweight the United States and we're overweight growth stocks, high quality growth stocks. We are, I'd say, more than average exposed to private equity, venture, and private credit. Those are three areas that we are very active in. Five years ago, Dan McCollum joined us. He was the deputy CEO at Brown, and Stephen Vaccaro joined us from the University of Pennsylvania Endowment. And so we had a very good program in private markets before they joined us, and I really believe it's second to none today. So having access to that kind of power in private equity makes us, we are focused on private markets more than many firms are. I love the idea that we're finally getting some real return again in the bond market. For most of my career, that was a key part of the portfolio. The last 10 years, the price of stability, in a sense, when one of the big things that a bond does in a portfolio is it reduces volatility. But when you have no real return in that bond portfolio, in a sense, the price you're paying for stability is very high. So the price for stability has gone down now that we have real returns coming out of bonds and cash. So we love that. But it's there's, that return is still not high enough for us, for our clients to come to uh, meet their mission in, in bonds. So we're emphasizing stocks and we're emphasizing U.S. and we're emphasizing these high quality growth stocks with strong balance sheets and competitive moats around them and so forth in, in technology and in medical equipment and so forth. You've known many investment managers over the years. Do you think they manage their own personal wealth? That's an interesting question. I, I feel like they manage their own personal wealth. I don't know that they manage their personal circumstances very well. Notion of defining success and, for example, and they tend to be concentrated in what they know. So one of the things that we do is work with a lot of successful private equity managers, for example, to build a program that is far less concentrated with careful diversification behind them so that if anything ever happens to them, their spouse is taken care of and their the program goes on and the day that they stop buying companies and operating them is set up for. So I think they may manage their their wealth better than they manage their 
personal lives because they're so consumed with work. How do you think about growing organically and staying independent in an acquisitions-driven world? We've always focused on organic growth. And the reason is that we created the firm to capture a strategic opportunity. And the strategic opportunity was this notion that the investment industry was built around product sales and that serious investors, and we, our clients are philanthropic families and the mission-driven institutions that they love. So we started with philanthropic families and then they pulled us into their alma mater and the community hospital and so forth. We really love that space. We think the work we're, we're doing is important because these philanthropic families and mission-driven institutions are working to make the world a better place. And we think, and our mission is to strengthen them. So we like that. And we believe that's a strategic opportunity. We can create a new kind of institution that doesn't sell products and does all the things we've been talking about, that that is a, a notion of creative destruction in the world. It's an improvement. And so we feel strongly about that. And the key is, if you make an acquisition, the successful acquisition is 100% about integration. And that's a business school basic. And so into what are we integrating them? Do we understand ourselves and our culture and our mission clearly enough that we, A, are able to look for people who are likely to embrace that and B, help them integrate successfully when we acquire them. And five years ago at our 30th anniversary, we entered into this good to great exercise. Jim Collins book, Good to Great. And uh, one of the phrases he says in there is you can buy growth, but you can't buy great. I feel like we had to have a great understanding of our culture and why it worked, why it allowed us to grow to $20 billion organically. And what parts of that culture were causal and what were coincidental? So we didn't want people to come in and just say, you got to do everything the way we do it. Yep, we're going to learn from them. But in the conversations when we're making acquisitions, these are the key things that we believe. Do you believe them also? So could we be good enough and informed enough to make that integration work? And it's interesting you ask us, Joe, because I think after five years of this intense and intensely productive good to great project, we are ready to at least look for acquisitions, but we're not a financial consolidator. We're a strategic integrator. And so we're not, there are a lot of people in the market today that are rolling up RIAs and then they have an exit strategy. So it's really a financial thing. They're trying to, and God bless them if they can do that successfully, that's good. That's just not who we are. We're trying to build a 21st century institution. And so we want people to join us to buy in, not sell out. We want really people to buy into this concept. I, always, I like to use me medical metaphors. We admire the culture of the Mayo Clinic. We were the Mayo Clinic, and we were looking for doctors' practices to join our firm, our culture, our institution. That's more analogous to than you see some buyout shops rolling up doctors' practices and then sell them into an HMO or something. That's not who we are. So we like the idea of acquisitions because we want to extend our reach. We want to reach more philanthropic families and mission-driven institutions in regions where we don't have a big presence. We have clients in 46 states, but we only have six offices. We could definitely, and we really admire those people on the ground in their community, those professionals who understand their market. They maybe have a billion or a $2 billion business. And we're never going to understand their community the way they do, but we can empower them with our capability. We haven't done our, uh, acquisitions in the past because of this focus on being a new kind of institution. But after this five years of hard work, I think we're ready to take that more seriously. So you're coming up on 35 years. Are you going to mark the occasion? We're not going to have a big occasion. We'll, we think we're 35 years is just another year. I did write a letter to everyone when we hit 30 years. And so I might have a, a version of it that goes out. Barron's asked me to write an essay about what you just asked, why we've always focused on organic growth. And that may end up being some part of our 35th year letter. But we have a holiday party every December. And this year at our 35th anniversary, we'll probably have a toast. John Hurdle, thank you for joining us today and sharing your wonderful insights. Thank you so much, Joe. It's a pleasure to be with you and look forward to staying in touch. Thanks for listening. If you like the podcast, please share it with your friends and take a minute to leave us a review on Apple Podcasts. We appreciate it.